My name is James Ross and it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the store and also Julia Meyerwitz katz and Dean Reddick. Before we begin tonight's proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It's upon their ancestral lands that Glee Books is built. Now I'd like to introduce Sheridan Linnell. She's the Associate Professor of Art Therapy at the University of Western Australia who will be chairing the panel tonight. If everyone could please join me in welcoming Sheridan, let's give her a warm Glee Books welcome. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Sheridan Linnell, uh, I work at Western Sydney University as the Associate Professor of Art Therapy and Director of Program for the Master of Art Therapy. It's my very great pleasure to be asked to chair the launch of Art Therapy in the Early Years, Therapeutic Interventions with Infants, Toddlers and Their Families, edited by Julia Meyerowitz katz and Dean Reddick, and published by Rutledge. Uh, I'm not going to speak for very long. My job is really the work-a-day job of keeping us on time, introducing people, doing all those sorts of things that actually as art therapists and other therapists are very much part of holding the frame of therapy. So I, I guess it's my job to hold the frame of this launch, despite the heat. And I think it's amazing that there are so many people here on such a hot day that you came here rather than going to the beach. <laughs> this book, as Carolyn Case points out in her introduction, fills a gap in the art therapy literature, which, as far as we know, doesn't have a major text that addresses art therapy in early childhood. This book maps out and goes deeply into how art psychotherapy can illuminate, support, and enrich that foundational time for the lives of individuals, families, and indeed our society and culture, early childhood. I feel that this book speaks to us directly, precisely at the time when more than ever, the sciences and the arts are coming together to underscore the deeply relational nature embodied in what it means to be human. This book has the power to touch something about our own origins and their resonances into our personal and professional lives. Reading it, I find it moving in every sense and feel called upon to make an embodied, thoughtful and active response in my work as an art therapy educator. And I hope it will speak similarly to other readers. I'm sure that the book will stimulate much thought discussion and debate within and beyond art therapy. Hopefully, it will inspire employers to employ more art therapists to work in services with young children and their families and carers, particularly here in Australia, where sometimes I think art therapy is as powerful, but also in some ways as marginalised as a consideration of early childhood itself. The book is sensitive, nuanced, at once specialised and also very accessible. So I encourage all of you, whether or not you work in this field, to consider reading it. Art therapy in the early years will be a very useful resource for art therapists, other creative therapists working with children, also for our colleagues in the other professions working in early childhood. It also makes a very exciting contribution to extending the theorisation and application of art therapy in general, bringing to a wider audience how art therapy can be a powerful intervention with those who are profoundly distressed and how art therapists contribute alongside other clinicians to emotional and psychological well-being. I'd now like to introduce, and I'm honoured to introduce, Ruth Mooney. Ruth Mooney has been, for a very long time, as long as I've been involved in art therapy, a senior figure, a friend and a mentor to art therapy in Australia and in Sydney in particular. She is in every sense other than what she calls herself, as far as I'm concerned, an art psychotherapist. Ruth is a psychoanalyst, a child and adolescent psychotherapist, and she trained with the Sydney Institute for Psychoanalysis 
and the Institute of Child and Adolescent Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy here in Sydney. She also completed the MA in Psychoanalytic Observational Studies with the Tavistock and the University of East London. And I can imagine how those observational studies of infants might deeply enrich Ruth's contribution to art therapy and her appreciation of, of this book. She's worked with children and families in residential and foster care, child and family mental health services for the family law court and in educational settings. Ruth supervised art therapy students at the Arndell Child and Adolescent Unit throughout the late 1990s and then went on to become involved in teaching in the art therapy diploma and master's programs at the University of Western Sydney for some years. So many people in this audience will have very strong memories of sitting in Ruth's lectures and how you, I guess, have internalised some of the ways that Ruth works and carried those with you into your professional work as an art therapist. She's currently working in private practice and has a special interest in the emotional development of infants and young children so I'm going to hand over to Ruth, Ruth Mooney. Thank you very much, Sheridan. Thank you very much, Julia, for asking me to launch the book. It is a great pleasure and um, I have really enjoyed reading the book and um, it's just lovely to be here today. Um, I've also been in conversation with Jill Westwood, who many of you know, and. Um, she also said that she would have loved to have been here today with everybody and she sends her congratulations and her love to all of the authors and um, to people that came today. So I'll just start. I'd like to tell you about my experience of reading this book, Art Therapy in the Early Years. Therapeutic Interventions with Infants, Toddlers and Their Families. I read the book over three days. I wanted to immerse myself, get into the depths of the water, see and feel from a submerged place. Each morning I read for a few hours and in the afternoons I wandered around with a growing accumulation of impressions, images unfolding, bubbling, coming to the surface. In Australia, four-year-old Lara heard a noise and explained to her art therapist that it was the police. They needed to be quiet or they would come and get them. In London, four-year-old Rosie asked her art therapist in the paediatric ward, when do you think a heart will become available? A child in Catalonia, in Spain, in an art therapy group of one to three-year-olds, asks, who is a mummy? I was reminded of a moment on my children's school playground. 18-month-old Tim waddled over to the cluster of trees. Maybe he was following a bird or maybe he was following something curious in his own mind. He stood still, looked up and screamed with absolute terror. He was suddenly on his own. His unrelenting wail could be heard throughout the playground. He was unable to turn his head to see his mother 20 metres away talking to some other mums. Tim's mother ran to him picked him up and wrapped her arms around him completely. I return to the images of the toddlers in this book. Lara, who thought the police could attack her. Her confusion about good and bad. Rosie had asked, when do you think a heart could become available? And the child from Catalonia had said, who is a mummy? There is an unreachable depth to these questions, an unimaginable sadness. Infants and toddlers having to manage much more 
than the ordinary joys and struggles of growing up. Developing attachments, facing separation, and then the Oedipal demands, sharing, jealousy and rivalry, and of course strong feelings. The art therapists show us toddlers and parents who are having to struggle with unbearable grief, loss and trauma. And for some, their development has been derailed or worryingly stuck. I felt angry about the level of ignorance still in the community about the emotional life of children, of infants and children. Why do we need to argue for early intervention? Surely it is obvious that the earlier the therapy occurs in relation to the child's development and in relation to the traumatic experiences, the better the outcome. However, it is not obvious. It is extremely important that collections of papers like this in this book are written to further understanding in the health, education and welfare fields. We must communicate what we are doing in the therapy room. We must be part of the wider infant and young child mental health conversation. Some time ago, I was asked to think about six-year-old Sarah. She returned to school a few weeks after her mother died. Occasionally she cried. The teacher felt helpless. He didn't know what to do, so he sent her out of class to go to the principal. The concern was that she was becoming attention-seeking. I suggested to the teacher that he could stay with her sadness, sit next to her and let her know that her tears are precious. They could help him to know how she is feeling. There is an outrage in hearing that situations like this can occur. However, such a live grief in a little girl could be experienced as unbearable and render thinking impossible for those around her. Therapeutic help is needed for the staff who have traumatised children in their care. While reading this book, I also found myself reflecting on my art making, figurative sculpture, the touch of clay in the palm of my hands, putting on and taking off, slapping and smoothing, cutting and hollowing, the feel of moisture and dryness, the struggle to see what is in front of me, the struggle to let my hands lead the way, creating for hours, deeply absorbed, making pieces that surprise me and realising I had been led by something within myself that I didn't know. I saw a sculpture by Baltazar Lobo in Tamora, Spain last year in a public courtyard. It was delightful. A warm, playful mother sitting on her bottom, proudly holding her chubby baby in the air. Both the mother and baby's arms and legs were outstretched, almost in flight. There was a mirroring in the physicality and certainly in the joy of life. The here I am, I can create, I can fly moment. I also thought about Karte Kollowitz, a German artist who made images of women and children, the poor and dying during the First World War. I thought about her Pieta, a mother with a strong back and a generous body, cradling her adult dying son. He is lying between her knees in her lap. It is a sculpture embodying immense pain. By the third day of reading art therapy in the early years, I felt I needed to go somewhere. Overwhelmed with the pain and distress of little children and the thoughtfulness of their therapists, 
I was profoundly moved and profoundly disturbed. My associations were volatile, infantile, extreme. I needed support. I needed strong arms and a generous body. I hopped on a train and went to the New South Wales Art Gallery to read the last two chapters. I sought out Bertram McKennell's Sappho, a sculpture of a pensive young woman. She is sitting, her arms around her knees and her head down. She is naked, beautiful, contemplative. I went to Rodin's Burgers of Calais, six men offering to sacrifice their lives to spare the city. Somehow, I think I was drawing strength from the contemplation, courage and pain concretized in bronze, the standing steady in front of me. I thought more about what I had been reading. I felt inspired. In each chapter of art therapy in the early years, there is close attention to the detail of the child's emotional experience. And this is from Julia. Two-year-old Jamil is extremely distressed. His mother, JT, has left the room in order to join the mother's group. I am holding him in my arms in order to support him in his distress at the separation from JT. He's very small and light and seems so much younger than he is. I feel that I'm cradling a baby only a few weeks old. I hear his cries which sound so young and observe how he screws up his face as he howls, his eyes tightly shut. Julia goes on. I notice how he clenches and unclenches his fists and waves tiny fingers in the air. I feel his distressed body pressing hotly against mine. He is curled up, rather like a neonate who has not stretched out. And I understand that a part of what I'm holding is very young and unformed. I have a growing sense that makes absolutely no sense. I feel as if I'm holding a creature, part of whom is not yet born. That is curious, as he is over one year old. He can walk, verbalise, and precociously he is toilet trained. There are illustrations of hard, distressing, emotional work for the child and art therapist. This is from Dean Reddick's chapter. Simon and his twin were born at 25 weeks. He was in hospital for the first five months of his life and had repeated surgical interventions. He achieved oral feeding, but after a stomach operation in his second year, required a gastronomy button and tube. At the age of three and a half, he had not returned to oral feeding. In therapy, Simon found a lolly stick which he used as a tongue depressant. He told me, as in Dean, he told me to say, ah, and I opened my mouth. In went the stick, so I gagged. He gave me a stick and I pretended to put it in his mouth and look inside. This game went round several times and he seemed excited. I asked what the doctor saw. Simon said I needed medicine. I found a little pot, but he took a pen and syringe-like tried to jab it into my mouth. He passed wind loudly and then reached. Evidence of his confusion where oral experiences seemed to be tangled up with feelings in his stomach and anus. He drew a car shouting, help baby Simon, help baby Peter. I asked where the car was going. Simon shouted, help doctor. After this session, and unusually for me, Dean says, 
I cried as I wrote my notes. The syringe penetrating my mouth, a representation of invasive, painful, phallic and mechanical care, replaced the nipple in the mouth experience and represented emergency medical help in lieu of a containing maternal object. In each chapter of this book, there is sensitive observation, moment to moment, and a thoughtfulness informed by an understanding of child development, family and community work, psychoanalysis, and the process of art making. The authors show us psychoanalytic psychotherapy in action. Three and a half year old Simon finds his voice. He screams out, help baby Simon, help baby Peter. The trauma that he has endured is more than many adults will face in a lifetime. With Dean's encouragement to tell him more, he screams again, help doctor. Simon is able to bring the terror alive. Show Dean what it has been like for his small, delicate body and fragile mind to endure repeated medical interventions. He shows him through the game, through drawings and through words. And together, he and his therapist face the emergency, now in the present. It is profoundly moving work. There is the process of art making and the making of meaning. This is from Pensry Row. Four-year-old Lara in the third session engaged in painting, adding white to different colours. I silently wondered about the symbolism of this in regard to her questioning of her genetic heritage, the mixing of her Anglo-African heritage. She also began to play with the baby dolls and used a baby voice. She became quite erratic and chaotic. She undressed and dismembered a doll, pulling off its arms, legs and head, filling the parts with sand. This was very disturbing to watch. I felt like I was witnessing abuse. And this vignette is from Celia Connolly and Judy King. After some time, three and a half year old Cara, as she ventured across the page with her paintbrush, looked up and told me, my mummy's name is Roberta. And Judy says, ah, Roberta, that's a lovely name, isn't it? Cara nodded in agreement and then there was a pause. Wanting to follow this lead of a more personal introduction, I then said, and your name is Cara and my name is Judy. Almost over the top of me, she said excitedly, my sister's name is Josie. She wanted me to know about her family. This was important to her. Cara continued doing her dots while mixing various colors. As she dubbed her dots, she said, I'm Aboriginal, stumbling over the word Aboriginal. I replied, yes, you're Aboriginal. I do dots, she told me. And she said, you do dots when you're Aboriginal. She continued, you don't do dots when you're not Aboriginal. She repeated this a number of times to make sure I got it. And Celia comments, Cara was making very sure that the therapist knew her Aboriginal identity. She was proudly locating herself within her community and heritage. There are deep transformations that occur over the process of the art therapy. And this is from Julia. After witnessing another mother and child in the art therapy group create a life-size portrait of the child together, JT, the mother, decided that she and her two-year-old son, Jamil, would make one too. When the image was completed, we picked it up off the floor and hung it on the wall. 
JT was very pleased with it. Jamil reacted with terror, calling it a monster and running into the far corner of the room where he cowered with fear. JT reacted to his response by laughing. Everyone else in the room was shocked into silence. The greyish white painted face had a deathly pallor and the black line underneath the head seemed to convey a wound, separating the head from the rest of the body. The face seemed more like a death mask than a portrait of a living child. And Julia says, this was a pivotal moment because the art making process enabled the expression of a deeply unconscious, previously unrepresented sh shared trauma. This communication was contained by the therapeutic processes in the playroom so that both Jamil and JT were supported and it was discussed in the mothers group. This segued into JT being enabled to engage in a process of mourning <coughs> and working through, which supported her in her symbolic capacities. Jamil was freed from a life-destroying psychoid ent entanglement with his mother, which was to do with unmourned, disenfranchised aspects of trauma and grief, so that his kernel of healthy curiosity in an engagement with the world could grow and he could begin to thrive. And then throughout the book, there is commitment to the process of continued reflection and working through and even long after the therapy. And this is from Julie Green. Julie made drawings and paintings at the art therapy table in a, on a preschool playground. She asks, were my paintings a response to the setting and its inhabitants rather than the interrelational moments? Were they a response to the chaotic group dynamics in the playground? Or were they a subjective response to the total environment? In, in retrospect, I think that they were all these things. The paintings, collages, are both tended to and tatty, so they are both cared for and ragged. I wonder how much I was filling up with primitive anxieties and reconnecting to my preschool self. By continuously making the paintings, collages, I was trying to find ways to contain and digest these difficult non-verbal states and to manage my own anxiety. There is a beautiful moment in the film Bright Star where Fanny Braun receives the news that her fiancé, John Keats, has died. She walks away from the family, collapses in tears at the bottom of the stairs, but then is shocked when she can't breathe. Her mother comes to her, holds her hands, looks at her face to face and breathes. She breathes so her daughter can breathe. In this excellent collection of papers, each art therapist metaphorically holds the hands of the child and family, looks at the reality of what needs to be faced moment to moment and encourages the child to bring into conscious awareness what could not be previously thought about. The art therapist thinks when the child and family cannot think. Each author shows the reader psychoanalytic psychotherapy in action, along with a unique contribution to this bringing back to life, bringing into life process. There is a deeply felt intuitive knowledge of body and mind. There is an inner can ignite the propensity for creativity in the self and other. There is an inherent experiential understanding of art as a sustained 
pre-verbal thinking process that needs to be nurtured patiently. Body-mind attention facilitates a mental space where bits and pieces of impressions arrive into consciousness. The wish and need to create is to live in the moment. It is to bring attention to the present moment, to connect body and mind, inside and outside, mental representations with embodied forms, unconscious and conscious. Metaphors can be lived in, revisited, challenged and looked at again over time. Sometimes meaning only really arrives when we know the symbolic terrain from inside ourselves. And there is the aesthetic, the embodiment of expression which can remain concretely as another container for continued thought. John Keats wrote, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And 23 years after her son's death, Carte Kollwitz said about her Pieta sculpture, there is no longer pain, only reflection. Congratulations, Julia, Dean, and all the art therapists and writers in this book. Thank you for showing us your work with these young children and their families. It is a terrific contribution that will provoke much needed thought and reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for such a, a very attuned, intelligent, embodied and deeply ethical reading of the book. I forgot about the heat for a moment, a bit as though a mother's cool hand had touched my forehead. Thank you. To respond to your reading, I would like to call upon one of the editors of the book, who we're very fortunate to have with us today. Julia is one of the most senior figures in art psychotherapy in Australia and the UK. She has influenced the development of the profession here and in the UK in ways we know about and ways that probably some of us can only barely guess at. She's also a Jungian analyst and she works in private practice in Sydney. With adults, couples and children, she also offers supervision to quite a few of the people here today, I might add, and consults to various organisations. She's published several papers on working with children in art therapy, on the supervision of art therapy and the role that art making plays in supervision, and on working psychoanalytically with couples. She's a member of the editorial board of the innovative International Journal of Art Therapy, Art Therapy Online, commonly known as Atoll, and has also served on the editorial boards of ANSJAT, which is the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Arts Therapy, and the International Journal of Art Therapy, previously <coughs> known as INSCAPE. Julia has taught on art therapy courses here and in the UK, including at Western Sydney University, and she's an active member of the Australian and New Zealand Society of Jungian Analysts and the Couple and Family Psychotherapy Association of Australia. And somehow, Julia has also found the time to work with her UK colleague, Dean Reddick, to conceptualise, draw together, edit, and patiently and skillfully work with an international group of authors to bring to fruition this beautiful and inspiring landmark publication. As a respondent to Ruth, I invite Julia to, well, you are already on the stage, Julia, <laughs> invite you to speak to your audience. I'll begin by saying, Ruth, thank you so much for taking us so eloquently into the essence of what this book is about. You have set a deeply felt and deeply reflective tone that resonates seamlessly with the book and I'm sure this will inform the rest of the afternoon. 
I'd like to express my thanks to you and to Sheridan for agreeing with such ease and grace to support the book with your time and thought. I know you are both busy people who are juggling a lot. I, I, while we're on the subject, there are other people to acknowledge and thank. Joanna Forshaw and her team at Routledge for their belief in us. James and the staff at Glebe Books for working collaboratively with me to develop the launch and Abril who agreed at short notice to film the afternoon for us. The purpose of which is for Dean and the UK authors and possibly to be used in the launch conference that will be held in London. If anybody has objections to being caught on film, please tell Abril and we'll edit you out. This has been a big project and any sizable project always has hidden supporters. There's a long list that includes our families, friends, analysts, psychotherapists, and supervisors. In the complexity of ordinary living, it's difficult to identify the exact threads that came together in the creation of this book, but they did. And you all contributed something. So a big thank to, you, to all of you. And of course, thanks go to the contributors, both in the UK and in Sydney, for their hard work and dedication. You will hear from the Sydney contributors after I speak. This is the first launch for this book. Planning for the UK launch is underway. Since an initial meeting and exploratory discussion between two strangers, Dean and myself, in the bustle of a busy conference in London in April 2013, we have an actual book. A book which, of which, for many reasons, we can all be proud. I am very aware that he's in London, and I know we are very much in his thoughts, and he regrets that he can't join us today. It is strange to be standing here without him, as since we began this journey, we have navigated every step of this way together. I know that I and all of us here today as a group are representing him and our UK and Spanish authors, and I hope that we do them all justice. It is humbling and moving to have attracted such a large group of people to a book launch on a sweltering Sydney afternoon. Thank you for giving up your Saturday afternoon. It is great to know that there is such interest and it's moving to feel so supported. And of course, the people who will benefit the most from this level of interest are the children and families who are the subject of the book. When Dean and I opened our conversations about the book, we knew that it would be groundbreaking. As even though it is not a new idea, there is a paucity of publications about art therapy in the early years. We shared a frustration with this lack, the lack of understanding and consequently the underuse of what we knew from our own experience over many years, we both trained in the 1980s, was a rich and effective means of supporting infants, toddlers and their families. And we were also aware, that, ha as has been mentioned, that in an ordinary way, professionals from allied disciplines, like child psychotherapists, there's a long list, pediatricians, pediatric nurses, psychologists, preschool teachers, and others, offer art materials to young children. We hope that the book will, to some extent, demystify art therapy, and also differentiate what art therapy is with this client group from what other professionals do. Even though, as the book demonstrates, there are overlaps. As art psychotherapists, we do something that is very specific and very skilled. And Dean and I hope that the book represents this in a way in which it will be accessible and useful for non-art therapists, as well as for art therapists. We had no idea that the book would emerge in the way that it has. We had a vision and we feel that we have realized our vision and more. We wanted the book to be primarily clinical, and we wanted it also to be embedded in appropriate theory. As we both approach our work from a psychoanalytic position, which in my mind includes objects relations and Jungian thinking, and we share a deep conviction to, the v to do with the value of psychoanalytic thinking, we wanted the book to represent that. There is one of the other things that came up so strongly in the book is the value of context and collegial relationships, something of which non-clinicians, including employers, often do not understand is how important the broader context is and also how much work is done by art psychotherapists outside of the sessions. Something else that emerges clearly in the book 
is the intensity of the therapist's experience. Ruth has introduced this idea already in her talk, and you'll hear more from the panel later on. The reverse is also true. Not only do art therapists benefit from the support of their colleagues, but employers, colleagues, and institutions can benefit from shared thinking with art psychotherapists and psychoanalytic psychotherapists in general, something that Ruth pointed out so movingly. I've been asked how Dean and I uh, navigated the editing process from opposite ends of the world in two time zones. Who did what, how did, you how did we divide up the work, etc. My answer is that we both did everything. Well, except the photoshopping and the indexing, as these relied on technical skills that I don't have. So although we shared the thinking, Dean did most of those. We both edited every draft of every chapter. This, as the authors will attest, resulted in them having to manage dozens of comments and questions on each draft. We were so fortunate in having a group of therapists who would take on board our comments and suggestions and work with us in developing their ideas and therefore the chapters. We, we worked together on the introduction and the conclusion and I feel came together as one voice. I've been asked how to approach the book, particularly for non-art therapists, and I would say, read the introduction and the conclusion first. They offer pointers which will support the reader's engagement with the material. And also, use the index. It's a fantastic index, and we were very lucky, well, I feel very lucky that Dean took that on board. I want to now say something about the dynamics around the art materials, the art processes, and mess the fundamental tools of our trade. As we write in our conclusion, mess in this context is ordinary and inevitable, and it also signals trauma. Mess making offers the very young child opportunities to experiment with mastery of the feelings of spilling and overflowing, and of the stuff of the body, and perhaps the body itself needing containment, and as such offers opportunities for development. When mess emerges in art therapy and when it is received as a communication, understood and thought about, rather than being managed, mess represents a potential for something new to emerge. But mess also signals trauma. Mess making can be a desperate communication of distress and can leave the therapist feeling as helpless as the child. It can feel like an attack on the body mind of the therapist, but that is the point as it is a strong communication of the child's experience and therefore an effective way of informing the therapist about what is happening for the child. As neuroscience is telling us, art therapy is a shared psychosomatic activity. After careful consideration of the themes that emerge through the book, we suggest that art making and art therapy is essentially a psychosomatic activity that links the bodies, minds, and brains of the participants within the context of a therapeutic relationship. By psychosomatic, we do not mean that pathology is somatized as a defense against experience, but the action of art making within a therapeutic relationship is to do with the body, brain, mind interaction of the individuals present. We have drawn on Winnicott's idea that we all have a psychosomatic partnership Susie Orbach's notion that the body is not so much a truth, but it's a relational outcome <coughs> just as much as the mind is. Whenever you see a body, you see a body that has been internalized in the context of a relationship with another body. We've also included Jung's fleeting and undeveloped reference to biology in his proposition of psychoid experience, which we understand as an unconscious body-mind process that links the therapist and patient. There is a tension within art therapy to do with the finished product and the process. Joy Chavarin, in her seminal work, has given a lot of thought to the finished product. She refers to the triangular transference dynamics around the work and has described the life in and of the picture that has to do with the meaning of the finished work. We have found, however, through this book, that there is a life in and of the art making in art therapy. This has to do with the complexity of the transferences surrounding the sensorial note, no, nature of the art process. 
We have linked this to Bolas's idea of the earliest human aesthetic in mother's care, an experience of an object that transforms the subject's internal and external world, an experience of psychosomatic transformation through mother's caregiving. So we have concluded on page 191 of the book that art therapy with this client group is a specialized form of psychotherapy in which there is body-to-body -body contact with the art materials so that art making within a therapeutic relationship becomes part of a shared, unconscious, psychosomatic potential and process, a form of layered embodied thinking which is inherently transformational and which provides the experience of a living, transformational, psychosomatic object which can be internalized. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I, I very much believe that the contribution you and Dean have made to art therapy theory by conceptualizing and really embodying and materializing this concept of the life in and of the art making is going to resonate with us in art therapy and beyond for a very long time to come. So thank you for that contribution. Very pleased to say that we have now a panel of chapter authors and that we have representatives of authors from each of the three sections of the book. Individual art therapy, parent, child, dyad and family art therapy and group art therapy. Uh, so Dean's going to add to the number of chairs because there will in fact be seven of us on the stage. The author of chapter two. I'm not going to read everybody's biographies because then we'll be here for a very long time but I do encourage you when you buy a copy of the book to look up each person's biography and find out a little bit about them because everyone who comes to be an art therapist or to work with art therapy uh, usually comes through a very interesting life and professional path. So do read about the authors for, your, um, for yourselves. So Pensy Rowe from Australia is going to introduce her chapter on mark making and leaving a mark. Processing the experience of art therapy with preschool children. Pensy. Hello. Thank you, Sheridan. Um, I hope you can hear me at the back. Uh, yes. Thanks, Danny. In my experience, there is an explosive, all consuming quality to what is brought to by preschool children to the art therapy room. Intense pre-verbal experiences are brought to the therapy space, enacted in the art making and play and communicated through projective processes in the transference. When I first began working with this age group, I was flooded with intense feelings and at times overwhelmed by the chaotic mess that the children made. This chapter is an exploration of counter-transference image making to process art therapy with a four-year-old girl. Lara was referred to art therapy by the director of her childcare centre due to challenging behaviour and stressful family events. The family were identified as at risk. And as the therapy unfolded, relational trauma and abuse emerged. I'm now going to read a passage from the chapter. Lara continued to explore the theme of identity and difference in her art making in the following session. The image on the left is the image that Lara made during this session. And the image on the right is my counter-transference image to the session, made after the session. Making a mixture with paint and glue and adding googly eyes and stars to the mixture she used her hands to spread the mixture on the page as well as smearing it onto my hands. Perhaps the eyes represent Lara's confusion about looking and being looked at. Lara's painting has two formless messy shapes that are connected, one with sparkles. Perhaps they represent her and me in the session. 
the mixture had a poo-like quality. The paint also referenced Lara's brown skin colour. During the session, she said that she was blacker than one of the baby dolls in the room and also blacker than her father. Lara. Lara had not met her father. Lara was exploring her identity and sharing her process with me, helping me feel what it was like for her. It felt chaotic and out of control. Yet when Lara put, her, put the paint on my hands, there was a care and reverence in this act. It felt significant and I felt as though I was joining in her ritual. Lara was making me as dirty as she felt inside. I wondered if she was acknowledging that the therapy was helping her with her internal mess. It seemed that she ne needed this to be experienced and felt by me, not just thought about, in order to be understood and that we were in this confusion together. She was leaving her mark on me both physically and psychically. Mayowitz Katz describes the importance of mutual contamination and infection occurring within the therapy for it to be effective. I wondered if perhaps Lara was also making me black like her father to explore her paternal transference. The second image was created in response to this session with Lara. Brown et al. discuss the use of image making to deepen understanding of embodied images by imitating a client's process of art making to gain greater consciousness of the client's communications and experiences. In this image, I employ some of the materials Lara used and explored my experience of being brought into her art making process as she smeared it onto my white hands. The leftover materials were used to concretely contain and process mess created in the session. In my image, shh represents <coughs> Lara's desire to control my responses and maintain authority within the space, attempting to inhibit my thinking. It was also the beginning of the word shit which references Lara's ambivalence as to whether the brown paint is a reference to black skin and black identity, or whether it is something dirty and possibly abusive. Perhaps she was feeling intruded upon by my responses or expressing an inhibiting part of herself. Perhaps the image echoes her communication about my gaze having been too much during the last session, as well as confusion about the abuse while also attempting to repair her wounds. Thank you. Thanks, Fancy. Chapter four, I do dots, art therapy with an Australian Aboriginal preschool child, is one of, I think, two chapters in the book that is co-authored by an art psychotherapist and her supervisor. So to speak to this chapter are the co-authors Celia Connolly and Judy King. Kara was a three and a half year old Aboriginal girl who lived in inner city Sydney. She was selected by the carers at her preschool to be part of a short term art therapy project because of instability and chaos in her own home situation. As this was part of a research project, all sessions were recorded by dictaphone, which gave a rich source of material to reflect on. Kara's second session reflected the overwhelming nature of her neediness and her ambivalence about it. She spent time filling up the wells on the palette with paint and making them overflow, often emptying the bottles of paint all onto the palette, even though it was already very full and or overflowing. This was in contrast to her attempts at times to keep things clean, wiping paint when it went onto her hand or carefully cleaning her brush in between colours. It seemed that she was compensating for her worries about overwhelming her therapist by occasionally holding back and trying to keep things under control. She then poured paint into the next well, again almost to the top. I asked, is it going to go over the edge? No, she simply replied. The paint then slurped over the edge and she said, uh-oh, and we both watched together. As she got to the end of the jar, I said, and that's the end of the blue. She then picked up the white jar, which was filled right up, and as she opened it, she said, it's a lot. Perhaps it was her feelings that were a lot, and in particular, her needy feelings. Perhaps the overflowing paint was her overflowing neediness that she became aware of 
when she had someone to sit and be present with her and her thoughts and her feelings. She started to paint a face quite quickly as I sat beside her and watched. A couple of times I said, ah, wonderingly, as I could see the face appear. She pointed out that, that's the eyes, and then I made the man, which I simply reflected back to her. She did not refer to the work again, but instead began to cover it layer by layer. She got up and picked out the big, blue, big jar of glue, and I pointed out this was glue for sticking things, and she continued, can I use the goo? She then picked out a large piece of tissue paper. She again delightedly informed me, it's pink, and laid it on top of the other sheet. I said, you're putting it on top of your blue man. And she pressed the tissue on top of the wet paint, deliberately pressing over the small image on the big page. She pasted the glue on the same spot over and over. She then used the back of a spoon to spread the glue on the tissue paper. They were then different colored paints spooned onto this same spot, layer upon layer, on top of where the man had been. Each layer was smoothed over from one side to the other. She then started to use the spoon to ladle water onto the paper. Again, she spread over the same spot with the back of the spoon, so that part of the page got wetter and wetter. There was something soothing about her movements, which had an almost meditative quality. She was quite deliberately covering the artwork and using a repetitive soothing action, reminiscent of a baby self-soothing or a parent patting a baby. It seems as though she was soothing her own deep feelings, as if part of her that had been acknowledged in the picture then had to be covered over, layer by layer, lovingly put to rest for the moment. However, when she came to add the water, she was moving into different territory, from soothing to destroying. The water added a new dimension of damaging the layers, different to her soothing. She then took the wet cloth, cut it and lay half of it on top of the layers. It was awkward for her to lay it on top of the layers as the edges sagged down. I supported the weight and together we placed it down. She patted on top of the cloth and exclaimed, look, it's coming through, as the glue and paint seeped through the perforations in the cloth. This pleased her. She then took one end and slowly rolled it up, seemingly delighted as I picked up white glue and blue paint, as it picked up white glue and blue paint. As she rolled it back, I said, there's the man, as he appeared from under the sodden tissue paper. She replied, that's a ripped one now, as the paper had torn a little. She had worked hard to cover her work, but had also been compelled to work hard to uncover it, especially as she added water and a cloth to the process. Her response showed that she didn't want to see it. She didn't want to expose that vulnerable part of herself. The aim was not to uncover. Rather, the point of the exercise was the process of pushing the limits of the paper to see how far it could hold out and then to damage it. We can surmise that she was so very aware of her own neediness and unsure that her carer would be able to withstand her demands, comparable to the rubbing. So instead she cleaned in order to control her neediness which felt so big and messy and dangerous. Thank you, Celia and Judy. Now, moving from the role of editor to the role of author, Julia Mayo-Rowitz-Katz is, I usually can say that, something's <laughs> happened to me in the heat. <laughs> so sorry, Julia. Is going to talk <coughs> about, read from her chapter, the magnificently named The Crisis of the Cream Cakes, an infant's food refusal as a representation of intergenerational trauma. Julia. Thank you. Look, I've had a lot of air time, so I'm not going to say much, but I thought I'd include this image because Ruth referred to it in her launch talk. This is the image that was made by a mother and child in a therapeutic play group in a child and adolescent mental health center. Um, the group was staffed by a team which included myself, a child psychotherapist, a psychoanalytic social worker, and a group analyst. Um, so it, the work was very well held. 
it conveys uh, so powerfully something of the nature of the complexity of the unconscious dynamics in parent-infant relationships, particularly when parents have suffered Im unimaginable trauma and loss as these parents had. Although even within loving relationships, there are pockets of unprocessed trauma which can interfere with ordinary individuation processes. When parents have suffered, these parents were exiled as children from their country of birth. They then experienced a very long period of miscarriage and failed IVF before they conceived Jamil. The emotional, react the emotional baggage that they were carrying was really complex and these are often very difficult to put into words. But as Jung said, often the hands know how to solve a riddle with which the intellect has struggled in vain. So art therapy offers something unique here, which can be made good use of in the context of a well-structured, contained, and well-supported psychotherapeutic environment. This image occurred at a pivotal moment within the context of a therapeutic playgroup the creation of this image enabled the mother to engage in a process of mourning and working through and freed Jamil from a life-destroying, psychosomatic, psycho-predicament with his mother, which was to do with disenfranchised aspects of trauma and grief. This supported his healthy curiosity in and engagement with the world, and he could begin to thrive. Thank you very much, Julia. It's always interesting to have slips of the tongue when you're in the company of Jungian and Freudian psychoanalysts, don't you think? <laughs> and I'm amazed I'm the only one doing it on such a hot afternoon. Chapter 10 is Making Waves, an art psychotherapist's retrospective review of counter-transference drawings made in a preschool setting written by Julie Green. Thanks, Sheridan. I am going to read a section of my chapter which describes a four-year-old little girl's movement from non-representational art making to representational art making. My aim here is to capture aspects of Kate's development and her emergent ability to share her inner world through her drawing and painting. At the art table, Kate struggled with messy hands and made multiple trips to the bathroom to wash them. Three weeks into the placement, I made some textured paint with sand mixed into it. Kate found the sandy liquid mix confronting and I gently... Oh, I gently coaxed her into ex exploring what it did on the paper using a brush. She painted a large mass on a piece of paper, which is the figure up there at the moment. The undifferentiated gritty blob was an adventurous exploration which happened in relationship with myself at the table. In showing Kate that the gritty mass of paint was safe to use and explore, I was showing her that she could make a mess within our being together and that we could survive it together. The fact that the result was held on the page on the table within the growing relationship was of tremendous help to her. She began to seek the relationship with me and the art table during my weekly visits. There were echoes of early and continued maternal mirroring in the interactions that followed. While pressing into me, Kate asked me to draw a dog for her. I asked her what she thought of when she thought of a dog. I waited and hmmmed and we wondered together. Then Kate replied, the ears. I took my hands above my head and positioned and shaped them as if they were the ears of a dog. Kate looked at them then took a pink pencil to paper and drew two very small arcs next to each other, open side down. The next item that was drawn was the nose, also drawn in pink. We then moved through the parts of the body that Kate spoke out loud when I wondered with her what else the body of the dog might have. Slowly, a rudimentary dog took shape in a brown pencil line drawing as all the dog parts were linked up with a big rectangular shape of the body. This was a very exciting and liberating moment for Kate. 
It was as if in my miming of the dog parts, I was saying through my actions, I know something about dog and I hold in my mind that you might know something about dog and I'm inviting you to find in your body mind your dog representation. In retrospect, I regard the drawing of the dog as a culminative developmental moment when symbolic thought and the ab ability to articulate or draw what one carries inside began to emerge and emerge as safely separate to the other. It was as if Kate had been at the cliff edge of developmental growth and made a leap to representational drawing. Kate frequently checked in with my face and gaze as she drew and I nodded reassuringly at those moments. We alternated brief moments of being separate with brief moments of being together. Greenspan says that the glances exchanged between two people are an acknowledgement of their mutual existence. Further images were drawn on the page, another dog appeared, the yellow sun was drawn, and then a person, a tree, all with this brand new ability to articulate in drawn pictures what was being thought and talked about within the therapeutic relationship. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We, we have, do you think, 10 minutes for questions, Julia? Not yeah, long, not long, because we don't want you all turning into undifferentiated, sweaty blobs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I don't think we're quite at that point yet. So I think I get to do the really exciting part because I've got a roving mic. So if anyone who has... A question for the panel would like to raise their hand. I will rush towards you with the microphone. Actually, I might walk slowly towards you with the microphone. Thank you, Julie, <laughs> for the fanning and the adjustment to the dress with the pink blobs, you might note. <laughs> Celia and Judy, I thought about your chapter as I got dressed. <laughs> Who has a question, please? <coughs> If you'd like to introduce yourself and ask the question, thank you. I'm Julie's father. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is not to Julie, but to the panel. Do you follow up on these people, these children? Do you follow up to see what happens in their future life and that to be able to test whether you've been of any benefit or not? <laughs> Trust Dad to ask something like that, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Look. Look, it's a very interesting question, and this is where the ending of therapy is often harder for the therapist than for the patient, because we never know. We do not break the, bound the psychotherapeutic boundary by contacting them. The thing with children this age is that biology really helps, and so if the intervention is hitting the right spot, you get feedback almost immediately that it's working. And the other way, the other barometer for trying to gauge whether it's working or not is the changing relationship in the room. And the way, as Julie I described, the child moves through developmental stages. Thanks. Anything else got anything to add? Um, I do happen to know what happened to little Kara because I visited the preschool a year later and they said that her speech had really improved and her beha there was a number of children that we were seeing in this research project. And they actually, uh, and this is such a lovely preschool, it's at the bottom of the Housing Commission block, and often they have children, as they grow up, go back to see the carers because they're so lovely. And there's quite a community and they actually told me how much she'd improved and, and we only did a short-term art therapy project, but yeah, they really felt that, it, that she'd benefited from it and that she was going really well. Thanks, Mr. Green. Uh, another question, perhaps? <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed you. Yeah, yeah. Can I get you to pass that along the road, please? Um, hello, my name is Valentina, and I'm a mom and an artist, and I've got a question for Julie or anyone. What represents too much details in art? 
what relationship when you do the art, because I'm looking, um, doing art therapy for myself and I'm stuck in details. Like I can do the one piece for years by adding more and more and more. Well, that's a really good question. And as I said in my talk, our psychotherapy is very specific and although and very skilled. So if you really want to work at depth with your own process, you need to be with an art psychotherapist. Making art on your own is, we know, it's a, it's a kind of therapy, it's relaxing, it takes your mind off things, you can have insights, but if you really want to work at depth, you need a therapist there because you need the relationship. Thank you. Some of the great artists have been just as obsessive, I have to say, with detail, you know. But yeah, absolutely. It's wonderful to work with an art therapist. So. Hi there. Um, my name's Loretta. I'm an early childhood teacher in the Montessori, in a Montessori school in Sydney. Um, I'm wondering how um, how early childhood teachers could use this book to um, better support and understand very anxious young children that we encounter daily? Uh, I didn't contextualise my chapter, but it was in a preschool. Uh, and that preschool had a very particular intervention that you may or may not be familiar with, which is the circle of security. Um, and there was also very, very good supervision there and art therapists. So in terms of how could the book help a team of early childhood teachers, if they read it and spoke together about it and talked about their qu questions, um, that would be a really, really valuable thing to do because of all the chapters and, and just the nature of that very early experience. Yeah, so I just think a reading and, and particularly a sharing with your colleagues would be really valuable. Yeah. Mine was also in an um, early childhood education and care centre and I've worked in other programs. Um, one of the ones that Julie's talking about using Circle of Security, um, which is an attachment-based program. But I think that it's really about coming to a place where you can question the communication behind the behaviour, you know, what, what's going on underneath. And if you can start to question that and think about that with your colleagues and you can start to hold the children's feelings and, and the feelings that are bubbling up in you as a result of being with them. Yeah. I just, oh, sorry. I'll just add to that. Um, obviously, as they're saying about thinking of the art as the child trying to express something, but not just in the final product. I guess that's what's come out of today. That's in the way in which they go about it, in the process, that there's so much expression really important things being expressed in the way in which they go about it and that comes from observing and I know teachers in preschools are usually dealing with so many things and so many children <coughs> excuse me there's not a great deal of opportunity for observing but if there was <laughs> it can be really valuable to understand what's going on inside that little person shall we take one more question were there other hands up as well as Jodie's. Um, hi, I, I'm an art therapist, but I don't work with early children uh, and childhood. I was just wondering, as, as Can this lady, you just this lady was talking, what would um, flag a referral in that environment to an art psychotherapist? The question was, what would flag a referral? in a preschool, what would make a preschool teacher make a referral to an art psychotherapist? I think there is lots of reasons, but often it's, um, it's, it's challenging behaviour because that's what's such a, so difficult for the educators to work with. And so that's usually what becomes a red flag, but often it can also be maybe a withdrawal or kind of slipping behind the scenes that would also warrant a referral. Um, yeah, but often it's challenging behaviours because because the child becomes a problem in the in the space. Yeah. 
Um, just to add to that, it also can sometimes be a breakdown between the child and the teachers. So that the, it might be the teacher that's actually bringing the difficulty or somebody else um, might, in the relationship, know that there's something not right or not working smoothly. And I suppose the difference about going to be referred to an art therapist as opposed to a general counsellor or a psychotherapist is the, use of, is the use of the art materials. As Celia said, how much paint can be poured into a palette or you know, whether they always use the tissue paper because it's so fragile or whatever. It's, it's in that observation, which is really difficult when you've got a room full of 30 kids. But if, if you identify a child that's at risk, then it's worth trying to give some time to that, but it's, it's in the use of the art materials, um, so the process is as important as the end result. I also just want to make a plug for art therapy. It's a good idea to employ one and have the, dis <laughs> have the discussion with the person who is right there who can go into the classroom and observe the child and feed back to the staff and also work with the staff on understanding their own emotional experiences to the child because often children are referred because the staff start to dread them coming into the classroom. And that's a signal from the child that something's wrong. I was going, I was going to hand the microphone to Julia to have the last word, but in a way I think she just did. <laughs> I'd like you, I, I think we have a presentation after which I warmly invite you all to consider purchasing this book uh, because what you will find when you read it is so much more than we've been able to tell you about it today. And I think it'll really help you understand why, although art touches all our lives and many people use art in therapy, there is something very specialised and, and very special about the work of art psychotherapists and it is in the making. It's in the making of the relationship, the making of the art. Thank you. Okay, so just before, before we break up for some cooling refreshments, uh, I'd just like to say thank you to Sheridan for convening today in your incredibly busy schedule. I'm about to unwrap your present for you. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you're you're, so you're much. welcome to do yeah. so, Julie. <laughs> thank you. And Ruth, thank you so much also for dedicating your energy and your time and your thoughtfulness. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> and finally, um, from all of us Sydney authors to Julia and Dean, who's not here, <laughs> so today to Julia. Thank you from all of us as contributors because um, we are aware how, as editors, you did the lion's share of the work and you contributed to our growth as authors. So thank you very much.